everybody. This is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. I hope you're all doing very well today. So, how does a vintage card collector turn into a modern card collector? Uh, this is something I'm going to tell you about. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a long story, and uh, it takes place about 1994, uh, specifically the 1994 baseball players' strike. Um, I, at that point, had really kind of lost my card collection uh, to or at least my original card collection to uh, rain to um, water damage and uh, I just kind of like re had to rebuild my collection um, the original collection that I had was the one that my father and I put together and it was your your 1987 tops your 86 tops 88 and, and so on and so this was kind of devastating when I did lose it, and uh, I, I didn't lose everything, but the majority of it I, I did, and um, I was still kind of completing uh, or going out to complete these sets again when the 1994 baseball players' strike happened, um, and I I always loved baseball. It, it is for me it, it is a fascinating sport. I, I know for a lot of people it is boring, but. Um, I grew up watching the Red Sox, and and so uh, I knew, you know, eventually I'd know a lot of these ball players that I would watch on TV, and um, it, it for me b baseball uh, kind of mirrors American society at any given era, and so um, that was one of the things that really kind of uh, drew me into the world of vintage sports cards. Now uh, I I really kind of didn't want to collect uh, cards anymore, or at least um, not modern cards, uh, when the baseball players' strike happened. Um, I was upset with the ball players and I was upset with the owners, but I still wanted to collect because I do love baseball. And um, vintage really kind of was that outlet. Uh, the thing with uh, vintage, for, for me at least, was that, uh, you know, I've never seen any of these ball players play, but I love the history. And on top of it, um, as I think I've probably told you guys in maybe even one of my first videos, uh, that uh, when I was in the fourth grade, one of my teachers took us on a trip to the card store across the street to uh, help us learn about math and problem solving. And that's there when I saw a bunch of T205s and T206s from 1909, 1911, and uh, 1951 tops, and a 1968 tops Pete Rose. And uh, I was absolutely enthralled. I, I really wanted to know more about these ball players and who issued these cards and, and the teams. But um, there wasn't a whole lot of people who could tell me these things. And I... I um I never forgot about that, um and so the the 1994 baseball players strike was really the catalyst for uh, me launching my uh, vintage card collection um, going forward, and so uh, years and years went past and and I I was really into you know vintage I used to go to like all the um, all the auction houses uh, there's this place. That I used to go to called Hall's Nostalgia in Arlington, Massachusetts. And um, I, I used to go there every Tuesday uh, and I'd, I'd pick up uh, a lot of the vintage stuff then. And, I, I, you know, a lot of it was uh, kind of like trial by error. And, and, and eventually I, I started to hang out with older, older uh, collectors who kind of took me under their wing and taught me about the. Uh, the do's and don'ts of vintage card collecting, and um, I, I learned a lot. Uh, some things that you really have to kind of like learn on your own, but uh, it does help when you when you have someone who knows what they're doing and has been in the field uh, and is willing to teach you. Um, <laughs> and and so uh, I, I did have. A lot of these these card collect these older card collectors and some of these guys, they um, they were collecting cards back in like the 1950s and 1960s, and uh, one guy in particular, his name is Bob, 
he uh, he he really was uh, he turned out, ended up being one of my best friends, and uh, we'd go to all these card shows, and uh, you know, talk on the phone, just uh, you know, maybe once or twice a week for, for a very long time, and so um, we'd always have this commonality in that we both like vintage sports cards, and you know, he he really knew his football. Um, more than anything, and so I always could rely on on him to tell me about the the ball players that I didn't know anything about. Um, it, it was, what happened was that uh, one day he he ended up um, being diagnosed with cancer, and within a, m- a month he was gone. And um, that was shortly before the pandemic, and um, it was really at this at this point in time where. I uh I had to take a step back and kind of <laughs> reevaluate everything. Um I I uh I suddenly found myself uh without really anybody to collect vintage with. None of my friends really collected vintage cards except for maybe like one or two. And um you know, it, it wasn't really like I, I could go and give them a quick call or just be like, hey, you got you want to hang out or something like that or, or whatever the case may be. And um, I uh, I really was thinking about stop stopping collecting all, all together. Uh, it was really difficult because, um, it, you know, if this hobby is a, a hobby that's meant to be shared and all of a sudden, between um, my friend passing away, and then all of a sudden, the uh, the, the hobby kind of just shut down for, for me anyway, uh, in the form of, of shows. I mean, during the pandemic, you didn't have any shows. They were all shutting down. And the only thing that you could do is if you wanted to collect was to go on eBay. Uh, the thing is, that's really kind of a lonely thing to do. Um, I. For me personally, I'd rather uh, talk about sports cards and collect sports cards and, and, and meet other people. And uh, the one thing that the shows did for me was that uh, I, I could go and talk to other people about cards and, and really kind of gain knowledge that way. And uh, for, and, and for me, really, um, the hobby is, is something that has uh, regenerated my interest in um, I, I guess uh, knowing uh, well anything really, um, as as I've said before, that uh, I did not have a good education growing up, and that was partly because of my disability and uh, the teachers who really were kind of I don't want to say ignorant, maybe they were, but they they just didn't really have any much of an interest in teaching me what I should have learned, and, and I. That really grew. I, I really had a, a resentment toward them, and uh, I I showed them that resentment, and um, it it it's something that I I didn't I, and I still don't want to uh, have anyone happen to, um, and and it's one of the reasons why I I try to teach people about um, you know, all these subjects and which kind of revolve around sports cards. So if you guys ever read any of my articles. And I, I may be talking about the, the ball players or the manufacturers, but I'm also uh, kind of telling you guys too about what America was like at any given era and why these things occurred to begin with. Uh, how, say for example, how the T206 set formed, uh, what were the legal uh, avenues for that to happen, and uh, what were the economic avenues for that to happen and who it was who actually did that and then like, on top of it who were the people and the uh, the principal economic factors for the cards to disappear and um, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of for me uh, the collecting cards is more like a, a redemption of uh, my my educational past that I should have had in school and really wasn't and and um, you know collecting is different for everybody and um, I I had you know at the point where uh, the pandemic 
it. Um, I, I really didn't have anybody to share this hobby with. And then um, it was maybe, maybe a year, two years before I picked it up again in a very kind of strange way. And uh, it, it was when I was typing in, for, for whatever reason, I typed in uh, sports cards on YouTube just to see if anybody was talking about it. Uh, because I, I really want to kind of gain knowledge. And um, I, I think really it's it's very important that um, you you gain as much knowledge about the hobby that you're participating in, or really anything for that matter. Uh, before you buy a car, you want to know all about that car, the, the, uh, the pros and cons to purchasing that car, or the the bond or whatever the case may be, the, the, the product itself. So I, I really wanted to kind of find out um, more about that stuff. And um, I, I typed in, I think I typed in like vintage or something like that or cards. And uh, one of the people I, I, I watched was uh, Dustin from the personal finance dad. Now is the um, the card collecting dad. What I really kind of thought was neat about his channel was that he was talking about modern stuff and some vintage stuff as well. And um, it got me to thinking about uh, what were the cards that I wanted to collect as a kid, but I couldn't because they weren't available. Now, um, you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have... Um, YouTube, or and we didn't have the uh, the internet. If you think about it, the internet is really uh, 20 years, basically 20 years old as we know it today, and it is kind of uh, grown. Um, and and uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. But uh, he was talking about a lot of this football stuff and basketball stuff, and um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, my own basketball history, if you will. Um, when it came to card collecting and basketball, uh, basketball really was very unpopular in, in the 1970s and 1980s. And um, a lot of TV stations didn't really uh, show basketball. And uh, I had actually written an article about this fairly lengthy article uh, called, the, it's, it's the 1981, it's my article on 1981, uh, the hobby in 1981, which uh, is, is really an interesting year for the hobby. And uh, I kind of like went through um, the tops flair, and then I looked at their products and the sports and what was going on in the sports. And uh, you know, if, if, if you guys want, you can check out that article. It's, it's fairly lengthy, but um, the, the one thing that I may not have actually realized at the time, and I don't think I did, was that there's a lot from 1981 that you can kind of compare to today, but uh, basketball in 1981, uh, especially as Topps is concerned, uh, they stopped. They, they completely stopped. They, they uh, didn't issue another set till I think 1989 or 90 or so. And uh, and its re and its replacement was a set uh, like this. Now, this is the I think this is the 1984-85 star. This is the arena. This is the Bucks issue, uh, Milwaukee Bucks. And maybe the the uh, the I know the Bucks had a game night. And uh, anyway, um, the the funny thing about this set is that I did see this set growing up as a kid, but. Uh, a lot of uh, my friends said, don't collect that set because they're not worth anything. So uh, I didn't. And and uh, it was really kind of a dumb thing. Um, and then I did see, I did see my friends throw these out in the trash. Um, they were really the only game in town because you, you had flair that came up in 1986 and again, 1987 and 88. But the 86 flare were really difficult to come across uh, because they were expensive even then. At least in my local card shop, they were because of the Michael Jordan. Um, so I never could get my hands on any. Uh, 
I, I could only get my hands on maybe a few, like a handful of 1987 uh, flair, and uh, I think maybe two. So, so basketball was really, it was a, a sport that was really unseen in the 1980s in, in my neck of the woods, and I think actually most of America uh, at, at one point or time. Um, channels would not, they were, they just refused to air basketball. And so, uh, you didn't have a whole lot of basketball cards. I never collected football as a kid. Um, and so I was always interested in the, the, the vintage football that I had was your Bowman issues. I, I got the majority of your hall of famers and the Bowman issues when I was a teenager in my early twenties through auctions. And um, so <laughs> uh, I, I was able to actually uh, purchase a lot of that stuff. Um, now, not so much. I think it's actually gone up in value, even though uh, a lot of people have said that your vintage football is, is really um, very cheap. And, and you know what, I agree with this. Um, it wasn't until I, I started watching more and more of Dustin's uh, videos that he had kind of asked, like, what are you guys collecting? And um, through through that, I, I kind of said, like, you know what? I'd like to go back and purchase more vintage basketball cards and more vintage football cards. And uh, I, I ended up picking up uh, a lot of your 1971 and 72 tops basketball and, and a lot of the 1970s, later 1970s issues as well, because they were cheap and um, your 1981 tops. And then um, uh, through that, I also ended up purchasing a lot of the, um, the vintage football cards from the, the mid 1950s through the uh, mid 1960s because those are also very cheap too. And it was all stuff that um, I, I uh, kind of passed up as a, as a kid. They're, they're cheap, stuff like, uh, I'll show you in fact, um, stuff like this. So um, I actually had a lot of basketball too. Uh, 19, your 1961, 62 flair and uh, a lot of the vintage that I had through um, auction houses I had actually sold so I could go to college, and um, and and so uh, a lot of that stuff was um, no longer around for me. And then um, there was like I guess a hole, if you will. There's a few holes, in fact. Um, and I uh, I slowly started to amass more more vintage. But the uh, <laughs> the one thing I I didn't have, which I, I think um, Dustin. And then even uh, Dakota from Sports Cards Anonymous kind of put a bug in my ear a couple of times. Um, so I, I did a mass of pretty good collection of, of uh, vintage football and vintage basketball through uh, those guys. And uh, one day I was actually collecting, uh, I was watching a, uh, a video that uh, Dakota had put out and um, I had no real interest in modern still at this point. And um, then I saw he had a card that looked like this, um, you know, and, and I got really curious. It, it's, a, it's a neat card. And uh, he was talking about it. And uh, I was like, you know what? That's a really cool card. I want to find out more about it. I want to see how much I can get one for. And uh, this actually is, um, it's the 1999 Diamond Skills, uh, or Black Diamond, uh, from Upper Deck. And it's it's uh, Kurt Warner's Rookie. And uh, I like Kurt Warner's story. I, I think it's really interesting. And um, I uh, wanted to find out more about it. So uh, I picked up a copy really cheap. And then it which kind of opened the floodgates for me. And, and I think, I think Dakota has said, you know, you got to watch out for those rabbit holes. Uh, and, and I, I, I agree a hundred percent. There, there were cards that um, I saw growing up that I was never able to get my hands on. I'll show you really quickly. 
Um, one of them was this, and this is a 1993 Upper Deck Fun Pack. And uh, I'll show you the, the sister set, if you will. So this is the 1994 uh, Upper Deck Fun Pack. And um, these cards were not around when I was growing up. I, I knew other people who had them, but I just couldn't get my hands on them. And they're not expensive today. They're they're really cheap. Um, but uh, there were other cards that I just kind of like looked at as well. And, and one of the things that I, I kind of noticed is the design of the card and the aesthetic, the eye appeal. And this is really kind of universal to all cards, uh, um, even if they have great ball players in them. Uh, if the the design is off, the the card is not going to be sold, and um, it's it's not going to look good for the company uh, afterwards. So the really kind of what happened was uh, that w when I was picking up all this vintage stuff. Um, I noticed that there was another, a, a, sometimes a dealer would put in another card um, in, in the, um, the, the vintage card uh, pack as well. And uh, one of those happened to have been uh, this, this card right here is Paul Pierce from the uh, 2003 uh, Upper Deck. It's uh, the standing O. So I had no idea about this card. I had never seen it before, and, and I wanted to find out more about it. Uh, the problem was, was that uh, I, I, where do you start? Because I, I had no idea, and and I didn't even know what year this was, and uh, that kind of reminds me of uh, what happened to Jefferson Burdick, and um, when Jefferson Burdick first started collecting sports cards. Uh, that was uh, back in 1909, 1910. Uh, he was like 10 years old. He was born in uh, 1900, I think February. And so, um, as as Burdick has said himself, and other people have said, that uh, he started to collect uh, T206s, and then and then by the time uh, about World War One started, uh, he just stopped collecting cards altogether, and uh, and and he you know he, he entered in the draft and same with uh, John D Wagner as well. John D Wagner was another ball uh, another ball card collector, mostly I think baseball cards. Um, and he 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 and uh, Burdick were the same age. I think Wagner was born in 1899, and uh, he he again um, stopped collecting cards in about uh, World War One as well. And then as time went by, uh, especially for uh, Burdick, um, Burdick had asked the question, um, is, if there's anybody else out there who collects cards, uh, let me know. And, and the thing is that Burdick actually, uh, he first started collecting or wanted to get back into collecting cards in 1933 after he took a trip to the 1933 or 34 uh, Chicago World's Fair. And uh, he ended up, picking up, um, I think, a couple of postcards, and he was really interested in it. And then that's how it uh, things kind of like spiraled, uh, or kind of snowball effect, where he um, asked um, A. Hyatt Mayer um, if he could write in Hobbies Magazine. That was 1935. And so uh from from that he wrote a bunch of articles in hobbies and then his his own uh newsletter uh and and that's where he started to pick up more and more collectors that he found um and and so uh by that time that was about 1937 or so and um john d wagner actually is probably one of the earliest card collectors to correspond with um, Jefferson Burdick. And uh, at this time, the only way you could get cards was through the mail. And uh, incredibly, uh, what Burdick used to do was um, he he would send cards, his cards to the mail for people to look at. And, and John D. Wagner also did this too. Uh, and, and he's actually somebody I'm, I'm writing about currently. 
Uh, I hope to have that article out pretty soon. Um, but they they'd go back and and they'd um you know they they'd trade among each other and there wasn't really any sense that these cards were worth any money. Uh, they weren't, in fact. It was only uh, later on that Burdick had said uh, that, you know, I, I know that these cards uh, are worth something or, or people want money for these cards. And he set out a system to try to figure out uh, what people might want to pay for them. Now, the, the only thing that he had was uh, the coin industry or the stamp industry. I think it was actually stamps, but I could be wrong where uh you had a price guide and uh you you would reach out to a, another collector and and you would say i would like this price for it and uh that collector would be like okay fine and it could be like 15 cents 25 cents whatever the case may be there wasn't really any um notion of what these cards should cost and uh there wasn't any notion of what they were uh what the what the rarity was and this is kind of interesting because um when jefferson burdick actually got back into card collecting in the 1930s in 1935 36 37 around there um he was mixing up all sorts of prices and uh he was judging them based on what prices were for either coins or for stamps i think it's actually stamps um it wasn't until years and years later in 1943 that uh charles uh charles bray yeah charles bray ended up handling the uh james and conklet collection and conklet was a original card collector from the 1880s so we do have uh some semblance of what the pre-card collecting days were like through him and uh a few others but uh we didn't have any prices uh established prices until 1943 and so uh it was really through uh charles bray that we start seeing more uh established prices by uh what people were buying at his uh his auction house and uh, he actually has the earliest auction house for card collections specifically. And uh, then it was, that's really kind of where um, uh, Burdick established all this stuff in his price guides that were, that were more reflective of what people were paying. At the same time in, in 1942, 43, you have a lot more uh, card collectors who are, are going into the service uh, and uh, normally you probably would have seen uh, or should have seen the hobby kind of uh, just t do a, a tank dive. Instead, it's the exact opposite. And uh, I, I have gone through that in a, in a different um, video, but um, I really kind of thought it was interesting uh, how the, the hobby has uh, just kind of transformed and how certain things kind of still remain the same. And uh, there's there's one really kind of universal truth uh, for any generation that is collecting cards, whether it is Jefferson Burdick's generation or my dad's generation, the baby boomers or, um, or mine. Or, and, and that is that um, a lot of collectors want to collect um, cards that they remembered as kids. Um, Burdick did this. He, he actually didn't uh, uh, have too many baseball cards. He, he couldn't get enough of them, in fact. And uh, it was really kind of up to John D. Wagner to help uh, him fill, fill, fill those gaps. And, and same with uh, Lionel Carter, too. And I, I think, I can't prove this, but I think that um, uh, a lot of the cards that Lionel Carter had, a lot of the vintage cards and stuff that um, was around even before he was born. So Carter was born in 1918. And a lot of the cards that he had uh, vintage-wise were prior to that, like your 
your 1916 M1, M101s and your T206s and all that. And I think a lot of that stuff, especially in off-grade, was from John D. Wagner. Now, I can't prove that, but it, it kind of makes sense. Um, because from from what Hobby Lore has said over the years is that uh, John, John D. Wagner, was a, he was also a veteran of World War II, and um, he was stateside. But uh, he had he had known Lionel Carter for a while, and uh, as a, as a thank you for his overseas service, um, John John D. Wagner ended up uh, sending uh, uh, Lionel Carter a, a box a shoebox filled with tobacco cards, and um, it, it's been said that Lionel Carter refused this box, but I, I really kind of doubt that very much. Uh, I, I do have a few Lionel Carter cards, collection cards, in my own collection, um, just because uh, of who it is, not necessarily the card itself. I wanted something from Lionel Carter because uh, he, he's really kind of an inspirational figure for me in my own writing. Uh, and so um, Lionel Carter has a lot of cards that are, are really kind of off condition and um, and a few of the cards that I've picked up over the years from the Lionel Connor collection are uh, off off center or off condition. And uh, Lionel Connor is really known as a collector to really want cards in pristine condition. And so he has these cards and they kind of don't fit with the Lionel Connor that we've all heard about. So that's where I think that uh, those uh, those cards uh, actually are from John D. Wagner. Now, can I prove that? Not really, but uh, it does kind of make sense. Um, it, it, as far as uh, modern cards go, now, um, I, I did uh, show you this card and, and how I got it uh, and, and, you know, the reasons why. It, and and uh, it's, it has to do with basically uh, his story and um, the more I started to look into modern cards, there was something also really interesting too, um, where uh, again, when you see these generations of card collectors um, and they're collecting cards that, of ball players that they remembered growing up, um, it, it it's really, um, Interesting that you have the baby boomers who were uh, collecting cards of the players that they grew up with. So this is really kind of the time in the 1980s where uh, my generation was just like, we we're very, very young. Um, and, and it was uh, our fathers who were taking us to card shows and, and card stores. And uh, it was, again, a shared experience between father and son, sometimes even father and daughter, or whatever the case may be. Um, and um, it, it, was, it was there that you saw a lot of prices go up. It was because the baby boomer generation uh, was now um, getting out of, uh, of college and uh, they were starting their own families. And uh, they could now afford cards that they couldn't when they were younger, or the cards that their moms threw out in, in the trash or whatever the case may be. And I, I think that really was a legitimate thing. Uh, my dad collected cards, I know that, but I'd, I'd ask him and he said, yeah, mom, throw them out. And uh, my buddy Bob, his parents threw out his cards too, but he said that um, one of the reasons why he got back into card collecting was because of his childhood and uh he, he wanted to kind of recreate that experience because that was it was he had a great childhood and um you know um i can't blame anybody this is why people collect is it's it's because they you know the older you get the more you want to try to recreate your childhood in some way form or fashion and then on top of it um it's the people that you meet in the hobby. And I, I've met some amazing people, some just fantastic people through the hobby. And uh, I, I've also gained an incredible education as well through these cards. Um, the, the other 
thing too, which I think is really interesting, is the design of some of these uh, modern cards. Uh, th there's a huge gap for me uh, when it comes to modern. I have no idea about a lot of this stuff, which is why I, I, I uh, routinely uh, go on to uh, Dakota's uh, page um, and, and, uh, and Dustin's page as well. And, uh, I, you know, you guys want to be um, well-rounded. It doesn't matter what it is. But if you're if you're a card collector, like you don't you want to kind of like know more about the cards and the players because I, I do, and I, I don't know really a whole lot about the um the modern players, but uh I, I quickly kind of found out about some of the stuff through uh, Dakota and Dustin, and uh and, and so uh I, let me show you some of the stuff because. For me, really, it's it, the design on some of the stuff is incredible, and and uh, it's it's not like uh, the cards that I grew up with, um, and and so I, I actually I picked up one of these, um, and and um, unfortunately my camera doesn't like to pick up baseball cards, uh, so um, this is a, uh, a all clear for takeoff. It's a, a Don Russ press proof of Dwight Howard. And I didn't know who Dwight Howard was, so I, I actually had to look him up. And um, I was kind of kind of impressed with with his background. I, I think he may probably go in the Hall of Fame at some point. Um, I I uh, I really kind of had to do a deep dive, and this is really the exact opposite of what I found out. Um, kind of like uh, maybe in my twenties when I I had talked to a uh, a dealer at a show. And uh, I had asked him, he was a, a modern card collector, and I had asked him uh, if he would ever get into vintage cards, because I, I showed him a couple of mine, and he's like, wow, I was like, I really like this stuff, but uh, he's like, I'm afraid of it. I'm like, what do you mean you're afraid? He's like, well, he's like, I, I, I'm afraid that I might mess up, I might screw up. He's like, I don't know anything about these cards. And um, I thought maybe if there's something that I could do was to teach other people about vintage and uh, the the ball players and try to get them interested because uh, one of the things that I, I had learned very early on and this is really have nothing to do with uh, the hobby or, or sports cards is that uh, you need to take control of your own education and you cannot leave it up to somebody else because. Uh, it, it, in my case, it, it really messed me up. I always uh, rely on on my own investigative skills uh, to to determine what is right and what is wrong. Um, ho however, uh, some of the artwork on, on these cards is just phenomenal. It's it's, it's amazing, um, and I think the technology can only get better. However, on the other and it, it can also get worse for a lot of collectors who actually don't. Um, either put in the time or resources, energy, or know about vintage enough uh, to get ripped off. And, and this is really where education comes in. Uh, and another set I kind of focused on as well uh, is, is this right here. This is the 2002 Don Russ uh, Gridiron Kings. And I picked up a lot of these cards, the Hall of Famers, and... Um, I I, uh, I really kind of had to do my homework on this stuff too, uh, and then there was a few others. So the uh, this set right here is, is another one, um, and Shaquille O'Neal is a is a ball player that I always wanted to add to my collection. It, this is really kind of where uh, you can build a really nice card collection for cheap money, and it's uh, it's fun. And this is really where the, the fun of the hobby comes in, that uh, you don't always have to uh, buy top shelf cards and um, you, you don't have to pay a lot of money uh, in order to build a nice collection. And uh, that's even true with vintage. And so uh, another card that I had found uh, was this right here. And, uh, you know, I, I noticed... Uh, um, Dakota from Sports Cards Anonymous, uh, he, he really loves his patch cards. I think even Dustin does too. 
And uh, so, I mean, if it wasn't for Dakota, I wouldn't even be able to pronounce Ladanian Tomlinson's name, to tell you the truth. I never, I never even watched the guy play, but uh, I, uh, I, I really enjoy the card. I, I like the style of it. I like the artwork of it. And um, I kind of like the fact that there is a, a patch here. Now, um, from uh, from what I remember, um, <laughs> patch cards at one time, they were really kind of unique. And then there were so many of them that people were just like, ah, it's just another thing. And um, I, I think they do have their own their own history to tell. Um, and, and so this one actually, this is actually numbered 13 to 25. It's uh, again, a 2002 uh, Don Russ, uh, Jersey Kings uh, studio series, but there's like a, um, a, a um, it, it's, it looks kind of like a mesh on top and that doesn't, there's a texture to it. And uh, that's really kind of interesting. And it kind of goes to um, really, how these cards are made and, and manufactured and uh, the time and energy that's actually put into making a card. Uh, it's a lot different than when it was when uh, Jefferson Verdict was collecting cards in 1909, 1910, or whenever. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting the way technology has progressed over the years. And, and it can be kind of dangerous too. And in, in one sense, is that um, the the better the technology has become, the easier I guess it has for uh, for forgers. In, in fact, um, and that that goes to the vintage cards. Now, um, I have heard card collectors and um, and 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 all sorts of people say like uh, I, I'm really afraid of vintage and and I just don't want to be ripped off. And um, my response to that is that um, I am always here to help you guys uh, with your questions on vintage. Um, I, I think uh, no matter where you are in your collecting, I guess, history or, or experiences, uh, you will get ripped off at least once. It's bound to happen. Even me, I've been ripped off a few times, um, but you have to learn from this stuff. And so uh, what I would do and what I have done and still continue to do is uh, when I go to shows or conventions, um, I, I write down a lot of notes on what I'm seeing, I take a lot of photographs, and uh, I will take uh, some cards with me as well. Um, and, and that's to compare and contrast. And uh, you really need to kind of study these cards. And um, you, if you, you're really looking for a specific card or a specific player on a card, um, just kind of know that um, each card is going to have its, uh, its pluses and its minuses. Now, uh, for example, I don't have it here with me, but the 1960 Topps uh, Frank Gifford is a, a perfect example of a card that you need to check because um, it is notorious for print spots and uh, some cards are also found uh, off center uh, like the the 1961 tops um, uh, Roger Maris is going to be notorious for being off center I believe uh, left to right but um, it's also the number two card in the set. I think it's number two card in the set any or number one anyway number two I think Anyway, um, it's it's usually sometimes where the card is placed on the sheet itself, and um, this is really where you need to do your homework. So I, I think what the modern cards have really kind of taught me uh, is that you need to collect what you like, what you enjoy, and uh, for me, it's not about the money. The money is is inconsequential. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with this. However, uh, it also is uh, kind of teaching me uh, also that this, whatever is going on now um, between the 2020 pandemic and uh, just maybe kind of prior to that and then uh, now presently, uh, this has already kind of played out. 
uh, especially in the price guides. Um, I'm never going to tell anybody not to collect modern stuff, but uh, I I have seen really kind of way too many Greg Jeffries type players, uh, players that were ramped up or collected uh, highly um, during their careers, and you have like at least one or two generations uh, after their careers where uh, nobody is collecting them, and um, they're not worth what they were when uh, when say like me as a younger um, idiot were collecting this stuff and the price guides actually uh, tell this they, they tell this story so um, the 1986 Don Russ for example I'm, I'm actually looking at a, uh, a price guide right here this is uh, July 1992 and so um, in, in this issue uh, you have the 1986 Don Russ. Uh, the complete set is going for between 120 and 175, and um, the Jose Canseco rookie is uh, $75 and going down. Now I do remember a time when that particular card was about 90 bucks, uh, if not more, and um, I had actually picked up the 1986 Don Russ set. Uh, from one of my buddies who I think his wife wanted him to uh, just get rid of all of those 80s sets and I picked them up and uh, I, I also picked up the um, specifically the uh, Jose Canseco rookie uh, because first off I, I really like that card I, I, the image is awesome and um, that, that really kind of uh, goes towards a, a great image and a great design will really kind of continue and in, in a lot of cases it can become a classic but um uh that that card in particular i really enjoyed and i had it as a kid and uh, it was destroyed and so i i recently picked it up a, a couple of years ago but i i, I picked it up uh autographed it is a uh, a, a design i think that really kind of um it emulates uh, what the 1980s were and uh, you, you're going to find a lot of designs like that on uh, the 1985 Don Ross uh, is another a great example and the 1984 Don Ross too. Don Ross was actually a really um, a really uh, cutting edge company for its day and um, the one thing um, I've noticed with a lot of design is that uh, it, it fits in with the era in which it was printed and um, it, it you know it's it's one of the ways that I like to teach people about history is through uh, design and um, in, that, in the 86 and the, the 1980s cards are really kind of a great uh, example of what the 1980s were and um, I, I do I kind of like off topic but uh, I do remember the the um, the clothing style is in the music of the 1980s very well and uh, there's a few things I really don't understand about the 1980s getting back to the prices a lot of these prices uh, were um, were really for active ball players then and um, since they're not active they're not actively being collected and the prices have really gone down so the 1984 Don Russ set I'm looking at right here um, it was $385 uh, that's still kind of a maybe an expensive set um, but uh, nowhere near I think I picked up um, that set for like 125 and I'm missing two cards out of the set I didn't realize it at the time when I bought it uh, however um, there is let's see there is a, a real another really interesting set to the 84 Flare update and uh, Kirby Puckett's uh, XRC. I think it's prior to his rookie. I don't really remember. I think that's what it was. Uh, that's 260 and going up. And then uh, Roger Clemens is 290. And Doc Gooden is 130. And um, I, I don't think that you're paying anywhere close to what those cards were when, when those players were playing, especially Doc Gooden today. He's more, I think, considered a, a semi-star, uh, and maybe in some circles a uh, common 
which is really too bad because I think Doc Gooden, if he had not gotten into the drug scene, he would have been a, a Hall of Famer. And I think even uh, Dwight Evans, uh, not yeah, well, Dwight Evans, definitely sure, but um, uh, Daryl Strawberry is what I'm trying to say. I think Daryl Strawberry would have gotten in the Hall of Fame, um, and, and maybe even uh, Keith Hernandez. But those guys got into the uh, nose candy pretty hard, and uh, it ruined their careers. Um, <laughs> it's just it's the uh, Pittsburgh drug trials are a really fascinating um, part of 1980s sports history, and uh, I, at some point I'm gonna I'm gonna. Uh, Probably write a, a pretty decent article on that. The other, the other thing too is um, I started to look at the vintage in this in this uh, bucket, and um, a lot of you guys might be thinking that um, the vintage was kind of cheap back then, and actually it was uh, even for its day. A lot of collectors and a lot of dealers were saying back in the very early 80s, 81, 82, 83 that um, they, they were really kind of shocked to see the values of some of the vintage cards go up in price, even like say Mickey Mantle, and it was becoming a, a, a real uh, problem in the hobby. Um, and and uh, it was really because uh, the, the baby boomers were now um, able to grab cards that they once had and, and they had, and, uh, or disposable, indisposable income, disposable income. Anyway, they had a lot more money is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and, and that kind of makes sense. And that's what's kind of going on now too. Um, you you have a lot more money in the hobby than uh, from what I remember <laughs> uh, growing up. But I think it's kind of the, it's, it's kind of the same, but kind of isn't. Uh, the new money in the hobby now may be coming from investment bankers. Uh, and, and investment firms and, and other like, companies where uh, in the 1980s and in the late 70s, it was not. Now we start seeing a lot more um, card values rise in the late 1970s. And a lot of people have said, well, no, it was the, uh, the, the boom happened in the 1980s. And uh, actually it started in the, 19, the late 1970s and it went all the way through the 1980s up until the 1994 baseball players strike when about 40% of the uh, prices took a nosedive even. I think it's even more than 40%. However, um, so, so you have to actually also uh, look at, when you're looking at the price, the prices of these cards, I'll give you an example. Um, let's see, I'll give you a good one. Uh, Warren Spawn from the 1948 Bowman, uh, that card is going for 250 Um First off, when I see that, I want to look at the, um, the rate of inflation. I want to look at what people were um, taking home in their take-home pay, what the uh, the the, the value, basically the value of the dollar, right? So it's changed greatly over the last... 40 years, um, the more money you print, obviously, you're, you're going to get uh, inflation. But um, what the uh, the hourly rate was for, for the average citizen, I'm factoring that in. So um, if your if you're take-home pay at the end of the day if you're, is like, uh, say, 25 or 30 bucks, and the card is, is, is worth 20, 20 bucks, um, are you, you know, are you going to buy that card at 20 bucks? Now you only have like five bucks left over. Most likely you're not going to. And you're also going to go and um, you're not going to pay full book for that card. Um, it, this, and that's really kind of where you, you need to have, you need to haggle over prices. Um, it, it's a fine art maybe, but um, the, the, uh, the art, if you will, of, negotiation should always factor into the price of the card or what you're willing to pay for it on both ends that there's got to be some negotiation there um, and if you don't feel comfortable with that negotiation or with the what the offer is you walk away um, or you get a second opinion and and a lot of times 
I'm actually going to get a second opinion from a friend of mine or two or three. Uh, it's just like the doctor's office. You go to the doctor's office, you get an opinion, and then uh, you go to another doctor's office and you get another opinion as well because, you know, things things happen. And, and like, you know, again, um, there are cards out there that I've actually never seen before. So um, I, I would take I would take a photograph of that card and and I would take notes and all this other good stuff. And, and then, um, you know, if, if a, a dealer friend of mine is nearby, I'll, I'll ask the dealer if if uh, uh, I, I can you know have a word with my friend and and, and then um, and, and make a decision. Uh, that sometimes doesn't work. You really need to really kind of get to know the dealer. Um, and, and this is really kind of where knowing dealers helps uh, at building a rapport with people. Um, and, and, and that's I think very important. Um, negotiation skills are very important as well. Um, and it's a, it's a skill that you can definitely uh, build up on when you go to shows. The more shows you go to, the better off you're going to be and you, the more you're going to see. Um, and so uh, there's another another set that I want to kind of uh, bring to your attention. It's a, it's a vintage set, but I think it has a lot to say about what is going on today. Um, and let me see. I skipped it by it. Uh, it is the 19... 69 tops baseball set now um this set in 1992 was uh 2600 dollars and uh let's see reggie jackson was uh 575 and going up and i think at one point that card was actually an 850 dollar card um and then there was another card too that i saw let me see it was oh uh, Nolan Ryan, which was four seventy five, and then uh, Johnny Bench, which was one seventy five and going down. In fact, I remember that Johnny Bench, the sixty nine tops Johnny Bench, was uh, three hundred and fifty dollar card, if not more. And my point being with those cards is that the you know uh, Jackson being seven uh, five seventy five and and all. You're not paying that price today for those specific cards. And the reason why is because the generation that collected those cards, they're, they're, they're shifting off. That's my father's generation. And uh, my generation, I mean, I collected, I collect those cards. Um, I, I, I really enjoy them, but I don't remember those players as kids, as a kid, I should say. And, and, um, they, this is the point is that, uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, these cards were being collected, um, by that generation, 20, 30, and 40 years after this, uh, the cards that you're collecting today, um, are not going to be collected, uh, in the same manner. Uh, my generation uh, or even Dakota's generation uh, from Sports Cards Anonymous, he, he may still be collecting the cards that he's collecting now, but um, that's only because he, he wants to and because he saw a lot of the players that he he is talking about uh, play. I, I, you know, I haven't. So um, I'm, I'm collecting uh, maybe some of the, the players and the cards that he's showing me uh, because I think they're very decent alternatives um, for, for players that are in the hall of fame and they're, they're cheaper. Um, that's why. And then on top of it, I'm collecting for the, for the, for the artwork as well. And, uh, that's the, that's where the, the 2002, uh, Don Russ gridiron Kings come in. Um, and there's another set too, that I'm going to show you in a different video that I saw specifically on his channel, which I really, really enjoy. And I think they have a, uh, a great backstory, uh, but that's going to be for another video. Uh, however, um, that to me is, is the really fascinating thing is uh, what is going to be collected by what generation and, and what time. Um, and, and obviously this, this price guide kind of spells that out for us. Um, and and uh, obviously, uh, I, I think around like 1989 or so, Johnny Bench and Karl Yastrzemski, 
uh, were first ballot Hall of Famers, and so their cards shot up. Um, and then, and then you had the nineteen ninety four baseball players strike, and it, 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 all these cards really just kind of took a, a nose dive in, in value, and, and a lot of the cards from the nineteen seventies and eighties um, are, are really uh, the the value just uh, is is not there. It, it has never gained. Um, uh, some cards have, like Nolan Ryan, obviously, uh, Yogi Berra. There's certain players that are going to always remain um, popular and valuable. Uh, not always, but uh, it, it depends. I mean, you're you're not you're not actively collecting Yogi Berra as a manager, uh, but but you are collecting his cards maybe as a player. But that's that's from the 1950s. Um, and so, uh, I, I just find it really kind of interesting. Um, and, and I, I understand that the cards that I collect today probably won't be worth what they are, uh, in the future. And I'm talking about the modern cards and a lot of the modern cards are really kind of over overprinted, uh, but it's a different kind of, uh, junk wax era. The, uh, the, the manufacturers have really become very sneaky. Uh, they did not learn their lesson from the junk wax era as, as far as I'm concerned and from what I'm seeing because you have um, it, every kind of rainbow card and, and unicorn pixie dust, whatever, and, and stuff that you know, I, I really kind of think is very silly. Um, but uh, you also have... Uh, cards of the same player, same pose, uh, that may be numbered. And, uh, the, the, the funny thing is, is that, um, at one point in time, uh, numbering cards was very unique. And, um, I think the 1992 leaf set may have the, uh, the elite, um, may have been like one of the first to do that. So that, that kind of makes it a historic set. Uh, and they're also autographed by the um, by the manufacturer, you know. Um, uh, however, uh, this stuff gets old really fast, um, and, and you see a lot of manufacturers kind of like uh, baseball. I'm talking about baseball card manufacturers. Um, they they didn't understand what uh, made a card rare to begin with. Um, and this was also the same thing with the uh, the comic book hobby as well. And uh, the, both the comic book hobby and um, card manufacturers or sports cards have a lot in common, more so than a lot of uh, collectors and dealers might believe. Um, and and uh, really, that's kind of because in the 1950s and 60s, you had a lot of comic book artists uh, come in a lot of guys from yeah, EC, EC Comics who are now out of a job after EC imploded in 1955 um, in 1956. A lot of those guys uh, were looking for new jobs and they found them with either Bowman, uh, Pryor, uh, or especially Topps. And um, so that's that's where the, the comic book uh, industry Kind of like met the sports card industry and had a baby, if you will, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, great design came uh, with that. So um, the the thing with the comic book industry, which I, I really kind of find interesting, is that they overproduced so many cards, are uh, not cards but comic comic books. Um, yeah, got card, baseball cards on the mind. 99.9% uh, .9 of the time. Anyway, um, the uh, the comic book industry really kind of imploded in, I think, 1997 or so. And uh, it, it, I think twice, in fact. But they, uh, they forgot what was, uh, what was rare or why these things were rare to begin with. And um, it was all through manufactured rarity that got them in trouble. And I think that's what's going to happen now, too. Uh, with manufactured rarity of these cards, uh, what may be valuable today is probably not going to be valuable uh, later on down the road. And um, it's it's uh, 
it's where you know the thing with that's going to get them in trouble is also the um the numbered cards do you have this like i said you have the same player but they're all different numbered and all different you know unicorn colors and rainbows and all this other stuff that i just don't understand um and, and and that can also get collectors in trouble as well um buying a lot of the stuff and, and uh we just don't have enough information on uh what is really kind of rare and i think i've heard dustin talk about this uh and even dakota on, on their channels as well because um pack odds are i think they're if if my if i had to guess i would guess that the the um card manufacturers do not want the pack odds on boxes and on packs um and, and um that really kind of would make sense um and why would you want them on packs to begin with i think at one point it was it was um in order to get um people to buy more packs if they knew what the the odds are but now that um, they know that they have a certain a large group of people who are going to collect cards no matter what, uh, and and um, they're not kind of worried about this stuff. And so, I mean, I could be wrong, but um, just from my own observations, uh, that's, that's kind of like, um, we're not going to find out what is actually rare now until 20 or 30 or 40 or even 50 or 60 years from now and um in some cases too uh like what happened with jefferson burdick um was you know when he was uh trying to find rare cards um he uh he didn't have anything to go on he didn't have any checklists and it wasn't until like the late or the early 1940s uh that he actually got a checklist together for the T206 set and we're still finding cards, you know, sometimes 130 years after they were issued. And um, the thing is, there are certain cards I'm sure today that are being issued that we don't know anything about. And uh, probably cards that um, have been held back or whatever the case may be, unissued cards, that it's gonna probably take another generation or two generations to find them and then um by that time uh like what happened to burdick was was that uh he had to start from scratch when it came to investigating a lot of these sets uh between him and buck barker and john d wagner and lionel carter and you know just a a, a whole slew of other people uh that i haven't even mentioned um it, it was up to them to figure out what was going on uh, with the cards that may have been issued 30, 40, even 80 years uh, prior to to them uh, getting into the hobby, so uh, I think that may actually happen as well. Uh, it's just a, it's just a really interesting thing, and that that's that's kind of my thoughts on um, a lot of the, the modern stuff. But uh, I have some other thoughts on this stuff too. Uh, I have no problem um, teaching you guys about this stuff. Um, we're getting into it. Something if you don't know, always ask questions. Um, I, I thought that was kind of universal. Uh, don't be afraid to ask a lot of questions. There, there are collectors out there that are going to help you out. And um, with that, guys, uh, I'm, I'm going to probably continue this at, at some other point. Uh, however, Thanks for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Give, give a, a like and a thumbs up. Um, if, and if you want to hear any more, if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, I'm always around. You can uh, leave a question uh, or an answer or whatever in the comment section below. And uh, I, I do have my email address as well. And uh, you can always go to my website as well. And uh, I don't have everything up there on my website. Uh, I, I've just done so many different articles over the years that uh, I'm, I'm kind of needing to refresh those articles and, and putting them up when I can. Um, and and uh, I, I, um, I really appreciate it, guys. And uh, until next time, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later. Uh, have a good one. Bye.